Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to a um, quick little supplemental for a lecture from last night. Um, I didn't quite get through all of the topics I wanted to, and so I thought I would record this just to help out a little bit maybe for, um, for your uh, laboratory number one and putting together project one uh, design docs. So um, what we were talking about yesterday was uh, concurrency and mutual exclusion, and we're sort of starting that whole process of how to get synchronization to work properly. And um, I just wanted to finish up that discussion. Uh, if you remember, we sort of introduced this issue that while well, threads can give us the ability to have uh, overlap from I.O. and computation, and therefore seem like a really nice, uh, efficient way to have multiple things happening at once, uh, we run into an interesting issue. So I had introduced this um, banking uh, example, where, for instance, what we did on a deposit was we would get the uh, account information, we'd increment it uh, because maybe we were doing a deposit and then we'd store it back. And uh, the reason threads were really going to help us out here is because if one user was, uh, you know, their account was stuck waiting for disk IO, another user could be adding to the balance or whatever. And so this was our motivation for going to threads, except as you see here, the, uh, the threads encounter the fact that the accounts are shared state. And so in this particular instance, uh, we show an example here where perhaps thread one gets the balance and then thread two gets the run and it grabs the balance, increments and uh, stores it back. And then thread one gets to run again. And as a result, um, the whole operation that was thread two is erased because thread one uh, overwrites it. Um, and if you remember, I talked about uh, the malicious scheduler viewpoint, which is you need to view the fact that there, there's a malicious Murphy's Law scheduler uh, running anytime you have multiple threads working on the uh, shared data that will find a way to uh, find that sequence that corrupts your data and it will do so at the worst possible time. So in this instance, our uh, malicious scheduler found a way to split up thread one and thread two, okay, at exactly the wrong times. Now, what we clearly need to do is we need to put an atomic section in here, which may, basically says that three instructions, load, add, and store, all become atomically bound together and can't be interleaved, okay? And so to do that, we talked about locks, and locks have come up earlier in the, in the um, term as well. And a lock is, in general, prevents somebody from doing something, excuse me, and uh, in the context here, you imagine locking before entering a critical section, unlocking when you leave, and waiting if something's locked. And so the important idea that uh, you ought to get from these uh, lectures on synchronization is that pretty much all synchronization problems are solved by waiting. So if you look back to our uh, bad example here, uh, the fact that thread one started doing something and then thread two popped in and screwed everything up and then thread one got to go again, if thread two were to just wait, uh, until thread one was done with this atomic section, we would have resolved this particular bad behavior. Okay, and so all uh, synchronization problems can be solved by waiting, and the trick is to wait only as much as you need to, not too much. And we'll talk a lot about uh, examples where you wait too long. And of course, when we talked about locks yesterday, I mentioned the fact that you need to uh, allocate and initialize a lock. So you could, for instance, on the left here, you might declare a mylock structure and run a lock init on a pointer to it, or on the on the right side you might uh, declare uh, pthread mutex t and then uh, initialize it in one way or another. That depends what on uh, which type of locks you're using. But then once you've done that, the locks provide a couple of atomic operations. One is acquire, which you know for instance in C syntax would take a pointer to the lock you're acquiring. And when you do that, you wait until the lock is free, and then you uh, grab it. And if you try to acquire the lock when somebody else has marked it as busy, then you wait. And wait in this context is going to mean your thread is put to sleep, so you're not wasting cycles. And we'll talk about that uh, in the next lecture. Um, and then when you're done, you release the lock, which will then free up potentially somebody who might be waiting. And so uh, looking at our banking problem again, what you see here is we identify uh, the critical section. So a good critical section here is uh, the fact that we want to have an atomic uh, sequence of this uh, getting of an account, incrementing, and storing back. Uh, 
and we uh, de uh, decorate around it the acquisition and release of the lock. And so we acquire the lock at the top and we release it at the bottom. And by acquiring and releasing a lock, what we've done is we've ensured that only one thread gets to run at any given time in the critical section. And that's what we call uh, asserting mutual exclusion. And so just to show you that a uh, little graphically here, we've got an animation. Here's the critical section with an acquire and a release. And if you have multiple threads that are all trying to uh, get into that critical section, so say here thread A, B, and C, what happens is only one of them gets the lock and the other ones uh, are forced to wait. So for instance, if uh, thread A is the one that gets the lock, what that really means is not only do they mark the lock as busy, but they're allowed through the acquire operation, Thread B and C are uh, waiting in acquire. So they, um, their threads, the acquire uh, syst uh, system call or whatever it happens to be, we'll talk about many options uh, starting next time, uh, they will be waiting there. So they won't emerge from the acquire yet. Okay, so that again, looking up top here, if multiple threads all call deposit at once, only one of them will actually get through the acquire and into the critical section. The rest of them will be waiting in the acquire uh, function call or system call. And so what I show you here is that as soon as A exits, then B is allowed to go through. And then as soon as B exits, then C is allowed to go through. And what ordering do things come through the acquire uh, operation? Well, unless it's a special type of lock where the semantics are explicitly specified, you have to alert, uh, assume that there's a non-deterministic choice as to which of the threads that are all waiting on the lock are allowed through at uh, any given time. The important part, however, being that only one of them is allowed through, okay? And to f circle back and finish up this example, in order to make this really work, the, uh, it's the account that is the shared data here. And so we need to make sure that all, uh, all code that accesses the account is protected by the same lock, okay? So for instance, there might be a, a uh, withdraw here, or there might be a uh, and initialize uh, or some other account operations, we need to make sure that they all use a lock from an acquire release around a critical section. And in particular, they need to use the same lock. Okay, all right. Now, um, some definitions that we had last time, last night as well. So synchronization is basically using atomic operations where an atomic operation is a sequence of non-interruptible, uh, non-interruptible instructions to ensure cooperation between threads to make sure that we don't get uh, undefined behavior, okay? And mutual exclusion is the technique that we talked about here, where by putting locks around a critical section and making sure that we exclude all but one thread at a time through that critical section, then we can make sure that we have an atomic operation there and that our synchronization works. Okay, and so that critical section is typically the piece of code that's being protected by an acquire and release of a lock. And uh, we put locks around it to get mutual exclusion to give us our synchronization. Okay. Now here's another concurrent program example. You got two threads A and B that compete with each other. One tries to increment the shared counter, the other tries to decrement it. Uh, and then we've got this, kind of a free for all, the thread A and thread B uh, show here. Uh, we have uh, basically they're sharing the same variable i. So in this instance, it's a global variable, but thread A sets it to zero and thread B sets it to zero. Um, so they're both setting the same shared variable to zero. And then uh, we're in a while loop and sort of while i is less than 10 for A, it sort of increments i. And B says, well, while i is greater than minus 10, it decrements. And uh, whoever wins, gets to say A wins or B wins, okay? And we're gonna assume that memory loads and stores are atomic, but uh, incrementing, decrementing are not atomic. And so from that standpoint, there's no difference between I equal I plus one and I plus plus. Those compile to the same underlying instructions, uh, which is a multi-instruction sequence, okay, in most cases. Um, and so what happens here is, uh, well, either of them could win, and in fact, we've got kind of a, a funny scenario where it's not even guaranteed that anyone can win, okay? Because um, we, if you look at uh, a hand simulation of this example, we could look at the inner loop. And here we have the example thread A and B. Thread A might load from wherever I is. Uh, 
and into register uh, one, which uh, maybe it's got a zero there. Thread B does the same thing. We got a zero. Remember, we initialized I to zero. And then uh, thread A basically adds one to it. And meanwhile, thread B subtracts one. And how could we get this perfect interleaving? Well, um, in this perfect interleaving could happen if we have two, co uh, two cores that are running, or maybe we have uh, hyper-threading, which we talked about last night as well. And then, of course, thread A goes ahead and stores a one because it added one to zero and got one, but thread B now stores a minus one. And notice that because of this interleaving, thread B ended up completely overriding the result of thread A. So thread A went to all this trouble and then nothing happened, okay, because thread B overrode it. So this is clearly a failure of atomic sections. You know, and you can imagine this race, and we're off. A gets off to an early start. B says, hmm, better go fast and tries really hard. A goes ahead and writes one. Then B goes and writes minus one, and A says, huh? I could have sworn I put a one there. Okay, this is uh, indicative of the types of problems that happen when you've got data races going on. Data races, I'll show you in a second here, is basically two threads attempting to access the same data. So that's basically this memory location M of I, uh, where one of them's a write. And here we have a situation where uh, not two of them are writes. Okay, so that's a data race. And the notion of simultaneous is really defined even when you only have a single CPU and you can't have simultaneous execution like this shows here in this example above, but the scheduler could switch out at any time. So you effectively have all of the liabilities as if you had simultaneous execution. So this may be concurrent, but not parallel, but it still behaves badly. Even in those instances, those are race conditions, okay? So we could pull out our locks now and we could say, well, here, I'm gonna put acquire and release around the, um, around the increment or decrement and now did we do better? Okay, well, here, now we no longer have an example where A thought it was incrementing but ended up doing nothing because B overwrote it, overwrote it because we've got locks. So thread A gets to the acquire first and it's busy incrementing, then thread B uh, gets to acquire, it's gonna have to wait until A is done, then it'll release the lock, and then B will get to go through the acquire and do its decrement. Um, so each increment and decrement operation is now atomic. That's good, okay? Um, and in many cases, this might be what you want. Technically, there's no longer any race condition here because it's never possible for thread A and thread B to be simultaneously accessing um, I when one of them's a write. And why is that? Well, because the simultaneous access can't happen because uh, the, the locking is going on here, all right? But um, the program is still broken, potentially, um, because this is uncontrolled, okay? Uh, a and B are just incrementing, decrementing, incrementing, decrementing. There's really no control as to how many loops there are or who wins. And so maybe technically you've gotten rid of the race condition in the middle, although there is this uh, looking at it in the while loop. So I suppose maybe you could still call it a race condition, but it's probably not really what you wanted. Um, this is really still a bad program. The one instance where you might want something like this, not with this loop, but maybe the I equal I plus one with a lock around it, is for instance, when you might have 100 threads that are all working on some part of a problem and each one of them wants to get a unique number once it starts, then they could call uh, an atomic section like this, which um, does an I equal I plus one and returns the result back to the caller. And now each of the threads, some thread will get one, th some thread will get two, some thread will get three, some thread will get 100. Uh, if you do that, then this could be an okay use of something like this. Um, and it turns out actually there are atomic instructions that don't even require you to do the lock and unlock in those instances. Okay. So um, one more locking example. Uh, here is this red black tree uh, that we talked about in one of our early lectures. And I also mentioned this last night. And in this instance, this tree is balanced in a very special way that the red black uh, algorithm maintains, okay, as you're inserting and deleting elements. And if we allow uncontrolled uh, access, simultaneity or race conditions, 
to, to screw up the structure of the tree, then it's not going to work properly anymore. It's not going to have the level of balance it's supposed to have. And so what we can do is we can put a single lock at the root and um, just make sure that before we touch the tree at all, we acquire the lock. Here, for instance, insert the number three and then release it. Uh, maybe over on thread B, we, we want to insert four. We could acquire the lock, uh, insert, release. Maybe we want to get uh, the number six. We could acquire the lock, search for six, and release. And what we've done is by putting um, acquire and release of the same lock around all operations, we make sure that at most, only one thread is ever manipulating the tree, okay? And so our critical sections are any time the tree is accessed, either read or written, we put locking around it, and therefore we make sure that the uh, correctness of the tree algorithm is as good as a uniprocessor, non-multi-threaded version, okay? And so this is a good use of locking, even though the threads are busy adding and removing things. In this instance, it makes sense because the different threads might be grabbing data from the network somewhere, adding it to the tree, searching because of some network query, looking in the tree, whatever, deleting from the tree. That makes some sense if we have all of these threads doing parallel operations and we make sure that the tree that's at the core of that algorithm is stable. Okay? And, um, so this makes sense. You might say this is a little slow because if you have a lot of threads, maybe most of them are uh, waiting in the acquire of their, you know, of their operations. And so um, maybe most of the threads are waiting. And so then you can start to ask a question, is there a way to make this faster? Well, the answer might be yes. That answer might be, well, you lock a certain path in the tree. So you put a lock on every node and when you're searching or you're modifying, then as you go down the tree, you lock the nodes so that anybody else who tries to go there um, doesn't encounter the same locks that you do. They might be able to work in parallel. You got to do that very carefully, OK? Um, for instance, if you always start by locking the top lock and then work your way down, then of course you haven't gained anything. So th while there are ways to do uh, locks on uh, lots of nodes in a tree-like structure in a way that keeps the, um, keeps the uh, data structure consistent under a variety of different simultaneous operations, you have to be very careful to do it. So this idea of putting a single lock at the root hopefully makes perfect sense to everybody. You know for a fact that that'll always be consistent. The moment you start trying to uh, parallelize this and allow more than one thread modifying and into the tree at a time, then you got to be really careful. And uh, you can start talking about maybe uh, somebody who's reading, does some advisory, um, uh, does some advisory locking that's all about reads just so that if a writer were to come along, they are not allowed to touch the part of the tree that the writer um, that the reader is in, and maybe that's an okay way to get some parallelism. But I just wanted to warn you that if you go down this path, you got to make sure you're careful what you're doing. Okay, enough on that. Let's ask ourselves if locking is going to be the general answer, okay? And I'll tell you right now, it's not. Uh, locking is a way to do synchronization, and it's a way to ensure critical sections. It's not always the easiest thing to do. So let's look at this producer consumer idea where we have a buffer that's finite size and we may have many um, producers of data that want to put the data on the buffer and many consumers and the producers can produce things and the consumers can consume things running perfectly in parallel and all that we really want to do is we want to make sure that if uh, the buffer is entirely full then producers are put to sleep uh, because they can't put anything in a full buffer. And so, uh, similarly, if the buffer is completely empty, then a consumer gets put to sleep because it can't take anything off of an empty buffer. So we want to make sure that there's still correctness here. Okay. And we certainly don't want the producer and consumer to have to work in lockstep. So uh, we want to do something that's a little more sophisticated than every uh, producer or consumer first grabs a lock that's associated with the whole buffer and then releases the lock. Okay, that's going to put us in that same problem that we kind of saw with the tree data structure. So what are we going to do? Okay, and there's many examples of producer-consumer. We talked about pipes uh, 
um, which I'm loosely showing you here with my GCC compiler example, uh, where the C preprocessor and, and the first and second phases of the compiler, then the assembler, and then the loader um, all feed into each other, and one produces results that are forwarded through a, a buffer to the next, to the next, to the next. That's a great example of this bounded buffer. Um, the example I'm going to do here, just because it's fun, is a Coke machine. Um, the producer can put in only a limited number of Coke bottles because the machine only holds so many. The consumers can't take uh, Coke uh, bottles out of an empty machine. And so um, what do we do? Okay, and examples, uh, other examples are web, web servers and routers and you name it, this bounded buffer is a good example. Okay, so here's an example of a circular buffer data structure where we have a, a write pointer and a read pointer and we set this up so that um, the read pointer kind of points to uh, the next thing to be read off the queue. And if you keep reading, you'll circularly wrap around. And if the, if the read pointer ever runs into the write pointer, then it knows that there's no data there. And similarly, if the write pointer ever runs into the read pointer, it knows that things uh, are full. Okay. And so uh, the, you know, the, the start on this is there's a buffer structure. There's two integers, a write index and a read index. And then there's an array, I'm roughly saying, you know, of some type star entries that's a buffer size. And notice that this is not a valid C code. Obviously, you can't say uh, arrow type arrow, although you might in some other language. And so we might ask some questions. How do we know if it's full on insert or empty on remove? And what do you do if it is? Uh, you need to put threads to sleep, you know, put the producer to sleep or the consumer to sleep. And uh, what do we actually need for our atomic operations? Okay, so this is a clear question uh, that comes up based on what I said there earlier. And so uh, here's our first cut. Okay, we'll have a mutex, which is a lock on the buffer. It's initially unlocked. And the producer might do something like this. They grab the lock. They sort of spin in a loop saying, well, while the buffer is full, don't do anything. Okay, because remember our producer can't put data into a full buffer. And then once it's no longer full, we enqueue an item on the uh, queue, and then we release the buffer lock. And then a consumer looks similarly where we acquire the lock on the buffer. Uh, we wait, and as long as it's empty, nothing happens. Otherwise, we know that it's not empty. That means we can dequeue. And then uh, we're gonna release the buffer lock uh, when we're done and return the item, okay? And so notice that what we've got here is uh, when the producer can't put anything because things are full, we're going to spin. And when the consumer can't get anything because it's empty, we'll spin. And so that's the weight, right? So I remember I said all uh, synchronization problems, uh, the solution has some form of weighting. This looks like this helps us, okay? Um, but not so well if you think about it, because look at this. If the producer acquires the lock and then goes into a spinning wait loop, then they have the lock acquired and they're in an infinite loop, which means they're waiting for the buffer to um, get emptied a little bit, except that if a consumer comes along, it's not gonna be able to acquire the lock because the producer's got the lock. So this consumer is gonna go to sleep waiting to acquire the lock forever, and this producer will be spinning forever and we've effectively got a, a deadlock here, okay? So or it's really technically a live lock, um, but it's a live lock that can't resolve. And so this is uh, not a good solution. So we gotta do something else, okay? So here might be a solution. Uh, and if you notice what's different here is the producer acquires the lock and then says, well, if the buffer is full, I'm gonna quickly release and then reacquire the lock. And then check again and release and acquire. And so notice, and the consumer's got a similar idea here. And if you notice, why is this better? Well, this is better because let's suppose that the producer is trying to put something on a full queue. They first acquire the lock, they notice the queue is full. And at that point, they release the lock, okay? They reacquire it and then they check again and they keep doing that over and over again until the buffer is not full and then they continue. And the reason this works, not very gracefully and not very well, is that the consumer, let's suppose that things are full, so the producer acquires the lock, notices they are full, the consumer comes along and yes, it could acquire the lock or try. Remember in our last example, they couldn't because uh, the producer was holding the lock. 
But the, if the consumer comes along and goes to sleep, sleep in the acquire, then um, the moment that the producer says, oh, buffer full release, it releases the lock, at which point the consumer comes out of the acquire and now it has the lock, okay? And it's gonna notice probably that the buffer is not empty because we know it was full and then it can DQ and go on. And so that release is actually gonna release and let the consumer go and this reacquire will potentially temporarily go to sleep until the consumer here finishes DQing and then releasing, at which point we'll come out of the acquire, we'll notice the buffer is no longer full, we'll enqueue and go on. So surprisingly, this works, okay? And this actually uh, works in a variety of circumstances, but it's not great because notice that we're, we're burning a whole lot of cycles. So if there are no consumers, what happens with the producer that's uh, encountering a full buffer is it's busy running release, acquire, release, acquire as fast as it can, and it's wasting CPU cycles to do nothing. So this is a form of busy waiting, okay? And so this isn't really gonna help us much. Now you almost, you, you might also ask, well, will this work on a single core uh, and the answer is, well, if you think of the idea of trying to acquire a lock when, um, you know, when somebody else has it as you've got to go to sleep, then what happens there is we go into the scheduler we talked about last night. And in that scheduler, at that point, we effectively relinquish uh, the lock, excuse me, effectively relinquish the CPU. And at that point, we, um, somebody else gets to run, which could potentially be the consumer, in which case if uh, they're ready to run, they'll DQ, and then when we get to run again, we'll acquire the lock and NQ. So this is actually gonna work on a single core, and it's also gonna work on a multiple core, um, but this really is wasting a whole bunch of CPU time. So this isn't great either. Um, and uh, so what else are we gonna do? So notice that um, if we actually go to sleep in an acquire, we're not wasting CPU. The problem with this solution is we're spinning where we're, if there's only the producer, a single producer, and the buffer's full, then we release and acquire and release and acquire, and we just keep going, wasting cycles forever. And uh, those cycles potentially could be used by some other code that ultimately becomes a consumer, which will resolve the producer, and we call that a busy wait. Talk about that uh, next time on Monday. So that's this little busy wait symbol. Okay, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're spinning, we're spinning, we're wasting cycles. Okay, so we need something else. And this is really just indicative of the general problem that locks, while they're generally powerful enough to do pretty much anything, aren't quite the right um, high level API to do what we want. So we would like a way to do something like this that lets us do a better job of managing resources um, than a lock, okay? And so higher level primitives and locks, we're gonna talk about a couple of them uh, as we move forward in the next couple of lectures, but we can ask ourselves what the right abstraction is for synchronizing threads that share memory. Now, clearly we said that a lock could be used in a way that allows us to share memory under a wide variety of circumstances, but uh, you have to admit that this particular spinning code here is not all that intuitive and certainly isn't all that uh, good use of resources. So maybe we want something else. And we want something as high level as possible where I think of locks as lower level, okay? And so good pri uh, primitives and practices are gonna be very important because the easier the code is to read and understand, the more likely you are to have it correct by design. Um, and so this is important. Okay, and it's really hard to find bugs in uh, multi-threaded code that shares data. And uh, Unix, you know, different variants of Unix are pretty stable now, but it was very common that um, Unix systems would just crash every week or so because of concurrency bugs, and that was just what people accepted. Okay, so synchronization is a way of coordinating multiple concurrent activities, and um, we're going to talk. Uh, about in the next several lectures, different ways of synchronizing that are a little bit more intuitive and more likely to be correct, okay? So that leads us to semaphores, which is the topic I wanted to get to today in this special segment. And if you remember, I, met, I introduced semaphores a bit uh, 
a couple of lectures ago. But a semaphore is a kind of generalized lock. The term comes from these uh, traffic symbols that you see on uh, railways. Okay, and it's the main uh, primitive used in the original Unix. It's also used in, P um, in PIDTOS and several other uh, operating systems as well. And a definition here is that a semaphore has a non-negative integer value and supports two operations. One, which is uh, down, or P is the, is the uh, standard thing to think about, which is an atomic operation that waits for the semaphore to become positive and then decrements it by one. And notice, for instance, I said here that it has a non-negative integer value, so that could be zero or, or higher. And so what down or P does is it waits for the semaphore to become positive. So if the semaphore is zero and I execute down, I wait. And that waiting is one where I go to sleep. It's not a spin wait or a busy wait. Okay, and then the moment that it becomes non-zero, okay, or positive, it then decrements by one and, and exits the down or P operation, okay? And then up is sort of the opposite of that, which is an atomic operation that increments the semaphore by one. And if somebody's sleeping on P, uh, it'll wake them up, okay? And that wake up then will try to decrement by one, and if they succeed, then one thread will get out, okay? And think of this as a signal operation. Think of P as a wait operation, and P, uh, stands for uh, Proberon and V for Verhogen, which is uh, Proberon is to test and uh, Verhogen is to increment in Dutch, which is where Dijkstra uh, named these from. Okay, so semaphores are just like integers, except, uh, well, one, there's no negative values, so they're whole numbers. Two, only operations allowed are P and V. So you can't actually read or write the values, except initially. Okay, so you set it to an initial value and then your only interface is P and V. And the operations are atomic. So if you have two P operations on two different threads, there's no way for them to decrement below zero. So those, whatever the implementation is, and we haven't gotten the implementation yet, it will ensure that there's no way for uh, the semaphore to ever get below zero. And for instance, a thread going to sleep on a P won't miss a wake up from a V. So it won't be the case that there'll be a thread sleeping with a P operation, but the semaphore itself is one or more. Okay, those, that uh, interface is ensured because P and V are atomic. Now POSIX actually has a semaphore that gives you the ability to read the value after initialization, but technically this is not part of the proper interface. Okay, so the proper interface of semaphores uh, have uh, only P and V after you've initialized, but if you use the POSIX versions, you can read the value as well. So the semaphore, as I mentioned, is from the railway analogy. Uh, here is, uh, here's an example of a semaphore initialized the two for resource control. So this is gonna start looking a little different than just locking. So here's a semaphore, here's two tracks, and a value of two basically says that we're gonna only allow two uh, trains into the train yard, switching yard at once. So when the first one comes along, it's going to come along the track and execute a P operation on this semaphore, taking its initialized value of two down to one, and uh, we'll go from there. So if you notice that first train came along, it executed P, um, that succeeded, so it got to keep going. The next train that comes along will execute P, and now the semaphore is equal to zero, but that second one succeeded. It's only when the third one comes along and tries to execute the P operation that it gets stopped on P. So this train here basically executes P and the P hasn't returned yet, okay? Or the down operation, as it's said in some, some interfaces, hasn't happened yet. So what would make it happen? Well, when the train exits and executes V, then it's gonna increment the, uh, so the V operation is gonna increment the semaphore and then that incrementing will wake up uh, somebody sleeping on the P operation, at which point they will decrement back to zero and get to go. So if we let the train go, this guy increments quickly to one, then decrements, and now we're back to where we were. So what's different here is that we have this idea of more uh, resources, like two here. This is basically giving us a way of enforcing the fact that there's only two things that are in this uh, rail yard. Whereas if you think about what uh, a lock is about mutual exclusion, 
that allows only one thing into a critical section. Okay, so this is allowing two or more. Okay, so there's at least two uses of semaphores. One is mutual exclusion, which is also sometimes called a binary semaphore or a mutex, which is really used uh, like a lock. Okay, and that's why if you look at how do you make a lock in uh, POSIX, they actually call it a mutex. So a mutex in a lock or a mutual exclusion uh, device is essentially a lock. Okay, if I set the initial value to one, and then I say, uh, I try to do a semaphore P on that semaphore, the first one that comes through will decrement it to zero and be busy doing the critical section. Any others that come through will now encounter the fact that the semaphore is equal to zero and won't be able to get through, and, uh, and therefore they will not be able to go forward, okay? Now another use of semaphores is a scheduling constraint. So for instance, we saw earlier with the train the idea that we had a scheduling constraint of two uh, items that could be in the rail yard maximum. Here, for instance, if we set the value to zero of the semaphore, then we get this idea that we can allow a thread to wait for a signal. So if thread one waits for the signal from thread two, what happens is thread two will schedule thread one when the event occurs. So here we go. This is kind of like we set the semaphore to zero and then join basically says, well, I'm going to try to do a semaphore P on the semaphore assuming that this starts out at zero, that's my initialization, then the thread join operation is gonna sleep because it's waiting for that semaphore to become non-zero. And then as soon as another thread finishes, that will increment the semaphore, which will take it above zero, which will wake up the thread join and will get exactly the same behavior as a thread join. Okay. okay. So revisiting the bounded buffer here for a moment, what we see is that we have con correctness constraints. So the consumer has to wait for the producer to fill buffers, okay? Or in the case of thinking about this as a Coke machine, the, uh, you know, you're a student, you go to the Coke machine, there are no Coke bottles in there, you gotta wait. Okay, I don't know, maybe it's really late, so you take a nap in front of the machine until there's somebody to fill the Coke machine. The producer, or the guy bringing the Coke bottles, has to wait for the consumer to empty the buffers. So if they, uh, the delivery guy shows up and the machine's full, in the, in the instance of what we're talking about here for a bounded buffer, they're forced to wait until somebody buys a bottle of Coke and then they can put their another, another Coke in. So we have uh, two correctness constraints, which are uh, about resources. The consumer waits for the producer to fill buffers. The producer waits for the consumer to empty buffers. And then one more constraint, which is a mutex constraint to make sure that we uh, have correctness on our queue itself and don't have bad behavior. And this is gonna be just like a lock, and it's gonna be needed for the same reason we needed a lock at the root of the red black tree in that earlier example, which is for correctness, we wanna make sure that the queue doesn't get screwed up, okay? And the reason, again, I just said this, but we need that mutual exclusion is because you know computers are stupid, and if you have multiple threads, both trying to manipulate the, the, uh, the reader and the writer part of the interface, then you're gonna get, um, you're going to get bad inconsistent behavior and there might be other more complicated things in this instance maybe the input puts things into a heap and the output takes the uh the one with the smallest value out of the heap so there's many instances of this bounded buffer that you could think of that are more sophisticated than just fifo all right so general rule of thumb you got to use a separate semaphore for each constraint so we have a semaphore for the full buffer constraint a semaphore for the empty buffer constraint and one for the mutex, so that's three semaphores. And we're gonna start out with no full slots because the machine is empty. We're gonna start out with 100% uh, empty slots because the machine is empty, right? And the mutex, we're gonna start out with it set to one because uh, we're interested in uh, using this as a lock or mutual exclusion. And so then our code is pretty simplistic and straightforward. So the producer comes along and says, oh, Let's first execute a semaphore P on empty slots. So what this says is if the number of empty slots is uh, zero, because the machine is full, we're gonna sleep here at that semaphore P. Okay, so the producer can't actually add any Coke machine, uh, bottles to the Coke machine if there are no empty slots. Assuming there were empty slots, then what the semaphore P does is it decrements the number of empty slots. Why? Because we're about to add another, uh, we're about to add another Coke bottle. So there's one less empty slot, 
And then notice that we grab the mutex with a semaphore P and we release it after we're done. And that's all to protect this queuing operation. We're going to enqueue a Coke into the machine or enqueue an item on the buffer. Okay, and why do we have a semaphore P followed and a semaphore V? Because the operation on enqueuing, we don't we can't afford to have multiple threads screwing it up. Okay, so this is think of a mutex as a lock. And the consumer is kind of the mirror image of this, right? So the consumer, say you're a student grabbing a bottle of Coke, says that if there are no full slots, because the number of full slots is zero, this semaphore P is going to go to sleep. Otherwise, if there's more than zero full slots, that means there's more than one and more than zero bottles of Coke, then the semaphore P operation will decrement the number of full slots, exit. We have our mutex around the DQ operation. So we grab um, the lock by doing a semaphore P, and then we release the lock by doing a semaphore V, and we correctly do a DQ. Okay. And then um, finally, we, when we're done, we increment the number of empty slots to tell the producer we need more. Okay, and I forgot saying we increment the number of full slots down here in the producer case. Okay, so think of these uh, as critical sections, okay, or maybe just the NQ and DQ that are being protected by mutexes. Okay, so that's one use of semaphores. Then this producer, when it puts a bottle of Coke in, not only does it increment the number of bottles of Coke by incrementing full slots, but if it turned out that there was a consumer waiting for a Coke bottle, then this semaphore V on full slots will wake up uh, an item that was sleeping on a semaphore P. Okay, And it could be, by the way, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, what if there are uh, five students sleeping on semaphore P? What happens is it might be the case that the semaphore V going from zero to one wakes them all up. But then the first thing they're going to try to do when they're awake is decrement the semaphore one of them will get a chance just because of the scheduler to decrement it uh, from one to zero and they'll exit semaphore P and get to go on. The rest of them will encounter that the semaphore P is back to zero already and they'll have to go immediately back to sleep. So this uh, full slot increment will only wake up one of the sleeping guys if in fact full slots went from zero to one when we did semaphore V. And then the flip side of this, is this semaphore V on empty slots will wake up the producer if it turns out that um, there is a producer sleeping on um, the fact that there aren't any empty slots for the bottles of Coke. Okay. So this is there to give you an idea that semaphores are a, a lot more um, sophisticated in what they can do. And they do, they do both mutex operations uh, like locking and they, all, and they do resource operations where you get to track the number of resources uh, and make an action based on that. Okay. So a little discussion about the symmetry uh, of this solution. So why um, do we do semi, semaphore P on empty buffer and semaphore V on full buffer for the producer, but the consumer does the opposite? Well, that's because the producer is uh, waiting when there's an empty buffer and signaling that they've filled a buffer. Whereas the consumer is waiting when there um, are no full buffers, but signaling when there's a new empty buffer. Okay, so we decrease the number of empty slots, we increase the number of occupied slots. Here we decrease the number of occupied slots and increase the number of empty slots. Notice, by the way, I just want to say this, that it's not, we have two semaphores for either end of the spectrum, okay, for whether we can add items to uh, to the front or not, and whether we can remove them from the back or not, those two semaphores uh, are on opposite ends of the buffer. So we need two of them. We can't just get by with a single uh, semaphore that tells us how many items are in there, because uh, then we wouldn't be able to sleep on one or the other side. Okay, so we need two, one for each side of the buffer. The other thing to, to notice is, is the order of these P's important? So the producer did do semaphore P on empty slots and then, um, and then uh, semaphore P on the mutex and then in Q and so on. Will this matter if I swap these? And the answer is yes. This can actually cause deadlock. Okay, why is that? Well, if you look, the producer comes in, executes semaphore P on the mutex, Okay, so it grabs the lock, 
And then it calls and says, oh, there are no empty slots. And so it goes to sleep. We've now got a situation where the producer is sleeping while holding the lock, which means that if the consumer comes along and tries to add a, a bottle of Coke, or tries to take away a bottle of Coke, excuse me, what'll happen is it'll uh, execute semaphore P on full slots. It'll try to grab the mutex, but it can't because the mutex has been grabbed by the producer after uh, just before it went to sleep. And so the consumer will be permanently stuck, all right? And this is uh, a bad deadlock scenario. Okay, and that and you could come up with a cycle. We'll talk more about deadlock later in the term. Is the order of the V's important? That's no. And the reason is that um, neither of these uh, block in any way. What they do is they increment a value and possibly wake somebody up. So you can do those in any order. Okay. What if we have two producers and two consumers? Well, if you look back at our solution back here, what you'll find is this works for any number of simultaneous producers and consumers. And um, the threads will just go to sleep if there's no space. And so this, is, uh, this particular solution works perfectly well for many producers and many consumers, okay? Yeah, especially the one producer, one consumer case, which we might have started with. Okay, um, don't need to change anything. So where are we going with synchronization? Um, so in the next uh, Monday and the, the rest of this particular term, we're gonna be going um, to various high level synchronization primitives using atomic operations. Um, you're going to see a bunch of hardware to help us. Uh, we're going to start with load and store being um, atomic, and then we're going to uh, disable interrupts uh, as a way of getting locking, and then we'll talk about using test and set and compare and swap. And then we're going to start putting in some higher level primitives. And what I mean by that is we already know what locks and semaphores are, but we're going to start talking about how do you build them. Okay, and we'll talk also then about monitors and send and receive and so on, more sophistication. And then we'll talk about shared programs. All right, so that's all I wanted in this supplement. Um, just to, wanted to talk to you a little bit more about locking and semaphores. Um, we'll repeat some of this material on Monday, but I just wanted to give you um, a little bit of an extra um, heads up here in case you were interested in uh, learning something more about semaphores before your design doc was due. All right, have a great um, rest of your day and we'll uh, see you on Monday. Thank you.